remember your baptism. Please be seated. For those of you who have any sort of background in the Lutheran Church might recognize those three words as a rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation with its origins in Martin Luther. He very frequently went about preaching, remember your baptism. I think we can probably take that even a step further. There's a similar rallying cry, which is a little harder on the ear to hear, and it is present throughout Christian mysticism as well as many of the world's other religious traditions. It's remember your death. Like I said, a little harder on the ear to hear. Remember your baptism. Remember your death. Three very poignant words, but what do they mean? How do we put this into practice? I had an experience that, of course, many of us in this room have had over the course of the last couple of weeks, and it's an experience no one ever asks for. But it brought to light for me, in a far deeper way than ever before, what it means to remember my baptism or to remember my death. This last Saturday, eight days ago, my stepfather passed from this life into the next. And it was as much as it was an experience for which we were all prepared. It had been years that he'd been fighting some catastrophic illnesses. As a matter of fact, the only real miracle in the midst of it was how long he had managed to cling to life. Many of us had expected that day to come much sooner. And in spite of all that, there was no way to avoid the simple fact that death is a jarring experience. There is something about seeing the body of someone with whom you have interacted, with whom you have shared so much life, now no longer containing the soul that it contained, that is simply jarring, and absolutely nothing can prepare you for it. And then, since he was an observant Jew, in fact a, a cantor at a temple over in Redwood City, uh, the full Jewish burial rites were observed, and one of those includes that the entire process must be concluded within eight days. And so his service was planned very quickly after the fact. On Tuesday, we laid him to rest at Hills of Eternity Cemetery in Coma. And part of the ritual is that the friends and family actually do the burial themselves. You take a shovel and you deposit dirt upon the coffin after it's been lowered into the ground. And once again, that sound, just the sound of earth hitting wood, is a hard sound to hear. There's something where every fiber of my being was screaming, no, no, it's not supposed to be this way. And yet, in the midst of all of it, there was also something where every fiber of my being was keenly aware, in a way that I cannot quantify or even qualify, of the very near and real presence of God. I had already felt it because I would had the blessing of being with him the night before he died, of singing some psalms and prayers with him, and even though he wasn't really conscious, I could see his toes moving in rhythm to some of the familiar Hebrew songs that would be sent on a Friday night on the, on the eve of the Sabbath. And the presence of God was just so palpable throughout this entire process, even though I can't say it was remotely happy or comfortable. And I've experienced that before, being in a more pastoral role as a hospital chaplain. I'll walk into the room where somebody either has just made the transition to the next life or is about to, and all of the typical boundaries are simply gone. A Catholic family will happily call in the nearest imam to pray with them. A family of any background doesn't care what this collar means. They have no questions about the nuances of the theology of the Episcopal Church. 
representative of that fact, would you please sing a song, say a prayer, do something to give us an audible and a tangible indication of that perfect and beautiful divine presence. There's something about being that close to death that also brings us that close to God. It's the oddest thing. This is why Martin Luther told us, remember your baptism. The way we do baptisms in the modern day church is a little too neat and clean for us to really see it. We sprinkle a little water on somebody's head. If the baby's in a bad mood, maybe the baby starts to cry, but then we bend his or her head off and hand it back to the mother, and, and all is well. But this is not the way baptisms have historically been done. We hear of Jesus coming up out of the water. John, I guarantee you, literally pushed him down into the River Jordan. His entire body was submerged. For several seconds, he could not take a breath. And in the ancient Christian history, if you've seen pictures of the baptistries in the ancient Near East, they are deep, cruciform pools. You would strip down to absolutely nothing and be immersed in the water for long enough that you could feel it. It is a ritual drowning, a ritual death. Because in baptism, not in some kind of ethereal, spiritual sort of way, but even in a very tangible, physical sort of way, we die with Christ. But we hear it in the Gospel. When we die with Christ, all of a sudden, just like it was at the moment of Christ's baptism, the heavens are opened. You know which other day we read this particular Gospel? Trinity Sunday. And we read it on Trinity Sunday because it is one of the only places in Scripture that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three in one, as in historic Christianity we've understood God, are all imminently present. The Son is there in the water, the Spirit descends on Him like a dove, and the Father's voice proclaims Him, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. There is no other place that God is quite so immediately and tangibly present, and it's because Jesus just went through this ritual death. So friends, this Sunday invites us into a horribly uncomfortable place. It invites us into a place where every sound and every sight might be jarring and unwelcome. It invites us into the place where death is not in some far-off arena, but right around the corner, incredibly present. And we might ask ourselves, why? Why all the morbidity? Why invite something in that doesn't have to be there? And I would say because by inviting it in, we also invite in something without which our lives are merely a shadow. We invite in that incredibly near presence of the one who says to us, you are my son, you are my daughter, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. We invite the possibility of hearing that voice with much greater clarity and much greater urgency than we almost ever <laughs> do. We pray every Sunday for thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Well, if we really mean it, we're asking for a kingdom where God is that close to us and the places in our lives where that happens are those liminal moments, birth and death. So my friends, this Sunday I invite you, remember your baptism, remember your death, at every moment, let your conscious thinking remind yourself, it's not way off in the distance. I'm not just bopping along in a more or less immortal life where if I squint hard enough, I can convince myself to go 
goes on that way forever.